The opening shots of the French and Indian War at Jamonville Glen and Fort Necessity have brought about a strong reaction from the British government in London. They recognize that the increasing tensions on the North American frontier between the British and French colonists and their native allies is bringing Britain and France closer and closer to war. As such, officials in London issue orders for the governments of the 13 colonies to convene in Albany, the capital of the province of New York. The meeting in Albany had been called due to a breakdown in negotiations between New York and the Mohawk Nation, which is part of the larger Iroquois Confederacy. More importantly for officials in Whitehall, however, is the desire for a treaty between the colonists and the Iroquois that would provide a clear defined colonial native relations policy. The colonial governments of Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts Bay, and New Hampshire all send commissioners to what becomes known as the Albany Congress. With war looming against France, the need for cooperation is urgent, especially for colonies likely to come under attack or invasion. Prior to the Albany Congress, a number of intellectuals and government officials had formulated and published several tentative plans for centralizing the colonial governments of North America. One figure of emergent prominence among this group of intellectuals is a Pennsylvanian Benjamin Franklin. Upon hearing of the Albany Congress, his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, publishes a political cartoon, Join or Die, which illustrates the importance of union by comparing the colonies to pieces of a snake's body. Franklin is appointed as a commissioner to the Congress from Pennsylvania. The Albany Congress begins on June 19, 1754, and the commissioners vote unanimously to discuss the possibility of union on the 24th. The Union Committee submits a draft of the plan on the 28th, and commissioners debate aspects of it until they adopt a final version known as the Albany Plan on July 10th, just six days after George Washington's surrender to the French fall in the battle for necessity. Despite the support of many colonial leaders, the plan, as formulated in Albany, does not become a reality. Colonial governments, since they now curb their own authority and territorial rights, either reject the Albany plan or choose not to act on it at all. The British government have already dispatched Major General Edward Braddock as military commander-in-chief along with two commissioners to handle native Indian relations and believes that directives from London will suffice in the management of colonial affairs. While the Albany Congress is meeting, events are unfolding elsewhere that will lead to a war on the frontier. Following the Battle of Fort Necessity, Uneasy tensions on the Anglo-French colonial borders of North America explode into a series of sharp skirmishes and small engagements. However, no formal state of war has yet to be declared by either the British or French governments against one another. But for all intents and purposes, the French and Indian War has begun. One of the first major campaigns of the French and Indian War would be fought in the northern regions of Acadia and Nova Scotia, at the Isthmus of Chinecto. Ever since the French colony of Acadia was established in the 17th century, tensions have been brewing between these French colonists, known as the Acadians, and the Puritan neighbors to the south in the New England colonies. In 1710, during Queen Anne's War, part of the larger European conflict known as the War of the Spanish Succession, English colonists successfully captured the Cadian capital of Port Royal following an eight-day siege, renaming it to Annapolis Royal. This effectively completed the English conquest of the Acadian Peninsula, which they renamed Nova Scotia. Tensions in the region continued to grow well into the mid-18th century, with the British having difficulty maintaining control over Nova Scotia during the 1740s conflict known as King George's War. The North American theater of the War of the Austrian Succession in Europe. After the conclusion of that war in 1748, George Montagu Dunk, the second Earl of Halifax, became president of the Board of Trade and was determined to anglicize Nova Scotia and make it a bastion of defense against New France. In 1749, he established a new settlement in Nova Scotia known as Halifax, intending to act as a counterweight to the French settlement of Louisbourg further north. He then promoted its settlement by New Englanders and other English Protestants. 
The settlement of Halifax worried the French, as they believed the French-speaking Acadian majority in the region would be swallowed up in a tide of Anglophone newcomers, and they also felt that the Acadians would be unable to covertly sell provisions to Louisbourg, as they had for years. The English were also worried that the French were intriguing among the Acadians and the local Abenaki and Mi'kmaq Indians, seeking to stir up rebellion. In fact, they were. A French missionary priest among the Mi'kmaqs, Father Abbe Jean-Louis Le Lautre, openly agitated for an insurrection to restore Acadia to the French and ultimately offered to buy scalps of English settlers for 100 livres each. This led to the outbreak of Father Le Lautre's war in 1749, which would last another seven years. In the year 1750, affairs reached a crisis in the region when the French erected a substantial pentagonal fortress named Fort Beausejour on the narrow isthmus of Chinecto, connecting Nova Scotia to the Canadian mainland. In response, the British built their own outpost nearby named Fort Lawrence, and an uneasy balance of power ensued until the French and Indian War broke the growing tensions in late 1754. In 1753, the Board of Trade has Charles Lawrence replace Peregrine Hobson as Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. Under Hobson's governorship, the Acadians of Nova Scotia were discovered illegally trading with their French neighbors in Louisbourg, while at the same time aiding native attacks in Nova Scotia. And so, on September 17, 1754, Lawrence orders a full trade embargo against Louisbourg and French Acadia, making it exceedingly difficult to supply the French garrisons in the region. On November 5th, Lawrence writes to William Shirley, governor of Massachusetts Bay, suggesting that the next spring presents an opportune moment to launch an expedition against the French garrison at Fort Beausejour. Shirley agrees, and soon the British begin making preparations for an offensive against Fort Beausejour, set for the spring of 1755. When Major General Edward Braddock arrives in Virginia on February 20th, 1755, to assume the post of Commander-in-Chief, North America, he adopts Governor Lawrence's plan for an expedition against Fort Beausejour and his own strategy for a three-pronged offensive against New France. While Braddock focuses his efforts on conducting the expedition against Fort Duquesne in the Ohio Valley, and other British colonial forces launch expeditions through the interior of New York, an expedition would be conducted from Nova Scotia against Fort Beausejour, the strongest French outpost in Acadia. Fort Beausejour is situated on a hill in between two marshes the Misaguish and Tantamar, and is arranged as a regular pentagonal fort with solid earthen ramparts. Its armament consists of 24 cannon and one mortar, and has a garrison of 160 troops from the French colonial marines, commanded by Louis de Pont du Chambon de Vergeon. Complementing the garrison are the local Acadian militia and allied native Indian forces led by Father Le Train. During the winter and early spring of 1755, British and New England officials began preparations for organizing the planned expedition against Fort Beausejour. Governor William Shirley raises a Massachusetts Provincial Regiment of 2,000 men, with Colonel Robert Mockton in command. Supporting the Massachusetts Regiment are the British Army regulars of the 47th Regiment of Foot, garrisoned in Fort Lawrence. On May 22nd, the expedition embarks from Boston aboard 31 transport ships escorted by a flotilla of three 24-gun Royal Navy frigates, the HMS Success, Mermaid, and Siren, under the command of Captain John Rouse. Following a brief supply stop in Annapolis Royal, the expedition presses on to the Chinecto Isthmus under favorable weather conditions. Under cover of a thick fog, the British fleet sails into the Cumberland Basin during the evening tide on June 1st and proceeds to unload the troops. Captain Rouse oversees the disembarkation of the Massachusetts Regiment completely undetected. It is not until 2 a.m. the next morning that the French are aware of the British landing. By then, the French can only watch as the British land on their side of the Missaguas River, since the guns of both Fort Beausejour and the British flotilla are out of range of one another. Davergeau is awoken by Acadian partisans who alert him to the British landing. He quickly assembles a war council at his office in the fort simultaneously dispatching a messenger to Louisbourg for aid. The fort's master gunner informs de Vajour that the northern ramparts are the obvious weakness in the fort's defenses, 
The Commandant agrees and promises to provide as many men as possible to work on improvements. As the French troops hastily upgrade their defenses, the church bells ring out the alarm and summons go out to the local population to send able-bodied men to the fort. Eventually, over 300 Acadians answer the call, increasing the size of the French garrison inside Fort Beausejour to around 700 Acadians, French colonial marines, and allied natives. On the evening of June 3, 1755, a council of war is held in the British headquarters at Fort Lawrence, with Colonel Mockton and his officers agreeing to lay siege to Fort Beausejour, marking the start of the offensive. Mockton's plan is to cross the Missaguas River at the tide head further north, pivot southwards, and then set up camp on the far side of the river near the high ground of Butte and Mirand, less than two miles from Fort Beausejour. Once his heavy guns are brought forward, Mockton would then search for a good position to build a siege line to either bombard the fort or encircle it and starve the French into submission. Mockton based his plan on the information of a French turncoat named Thomas Picton, who was in the fort feeding the English vital information about the garrison's weaknesses. The linchpin of Mockton's plan is finding a suitable crossing point over the Massaguish. At the tide head of the river, the earthwork dike is cut low, leaving a swampy marsh surrounding the river bank. Further north from the tide head, at a place called Pont Butte, the Acadians have constructed a clear road and a sturdy timber bridge over the Massaguish situated in a valley between two high ridges with a commanding view of the river. Mockton is well aware that the only way to cross a river in the muddy tidal flats is to seize a strategic bridge at Pont Butte. The next morning, the drums sound the Reve and the British and Provincials muster around Fort Lawrence. From the ramparts atop Fort Beausejour, the French watch the British and Provincials march out from Fort Lawrence. As they observe the British colonial column march northwards, the French withdraw from their picket outposts along the Missaguish. As the English neared the bridge, French forces started to assemble to oppose the crossing of the river, increasing the forces size to around 300, including Acadians and natives. It takes the British approximately four hours to march three and a half miles from Fort Lawrence along the old French road to the bridge, a slow yet steady pace. After completing their march up the Massaguish, the British arrived at Pont Butte just before noon. The British find the small timber bridge burned and the French waiting for them on the other side. Despite the enemy facing down on them, Colonel Mockton decides to press on. The French and Indians have built a small earthwork redoubt and a makeshift barricade in front of the burnt bridge, and a wooden stockade lies behind the Pont Butte hamlet. When the British call moves into range of their muskets, the native Indian warriors let out a battle cry which terrifies the British redcoats and provincials. The French infantry inside the Pont Butte redoubt open fire, laying down brisk musket volleys at the Massachusetts regiment, stopping the advance. Despite this initial halt, the British and Provincials then form battle lines and rank the redoubt. Unable to match the superior English fire, the French and Indian defenders fled, ensuring to burn their positions before retreating towards Fort Beausejour. Once the French abandon their defensive position on Palm Butte, the British bring up the Massachusetts regiment's pioneers and rebuild the burnt bridge. They then move along the western edge of the marsh for a short way before seizing the high ground at Butte of Moran, where they bivouac for the evening. With their defeat at Pont Butte, the French have now effectively ceded the initiative to the British. Over the next three days, Colonel Mockton reconnoitres his position around the Butte of Moran, while simultaneously building up a siege line to prepare a bombardment of the enemy fort. During the 5th and 6th, heavy artillery is ferried up the Massaguish to Mockton's position and then he puts his pioneers to work building shallow trenches and earthworks for the cannons. The British establish an inflating battery against the riverbank on the 7th. Meanwhile, the French inside Fort Beausejour busied themselves with tearing down the roofs of their buildings to lower the profile of the fort and prevent cannon fire from damaging the houses. During the nights of the 6th and 7th, a cannon patrols proud the British lines, but were unable to seriously hamper Mockton's construction of siege works. For the next week, the British continued busily fortifying the heights of Butte and Mirand and building up their artillery siege lines. French sorties from Fort Beausejour failed to disrupt the buildup. During the late afternoon of the 12th, the British dispatched 400 provincials under Lieutenant Colonel Scott and a company of regulars under Captain Spittle to occupy and secure the Butte of Charles in order to extend the siege lines there. Having spotted the Massachusetts provincials and regulars moving toward Butte of Charles, the French sent out a large sortie to meet them 
the two sides opened fire on one another at Buda Charles, with the British seizing the high ground and using it to their advantage to press back the French sortie in a sharp skirmish. On the morning of June 13th, the British complete their main line and are commencing the buildup of a siege parallel, angling the British ever closer to Fort Beausejour. At 7 a.m. on the 13th, the British bring up two small 8-inch mortars and some small caliber artillery to the siege line. Once in place, Mockton orders the guns to commence the bombardment. Even though they fire around 50 shells, the barrage is largely ineffective, but it does wreak havoc inside the fort when a mortar shell instantly kills an Acadian worker, halting all further construction efforts within the walls. The British continue their bombardment into the morning of the 14th. At 10 p.m. that night, a French courier is permitted to pass through the British lines into the fort, bearing a message for the Commandant from the Governor of Louisbourg. He informs Commandant de Vergeur that the Royal Navy ships have effectively blockaded the harbor approaches, and that relief will not be possible. De Vergeur tries to keep the news a secret, but word soon spreads through the ranks that no relief is incoming. The majority of the Acadians lose heart at this news, and over 80 of them desert that night. Without hope or relief, the morale inside Fort Beausajour deteriorates rapidly. British mortars and cannons blaze into action from their trenches during the 15th. Finally, on June 16th, Mockton orders all siege batteries to open a general bombardment against Fort Beausajour, effectively reducing the fortification. Six Frenchmen are killed outright, completely ruining the already poor morale of the garrison. With his hold over the Acadians broken, De Vajor holds a council of war with his officers and says he will open capitulation talks with Colonel Mockton, much against the wishes of Father Le Lutre. Father Le Lutre decides to escape from the fort and flee to Fort Gaspereau before moving on to Quebec. At 9 a.m. on June 16th, the white flag is raised over Fort Beausajour, and talks begin between Mockton and De Vajor. The initial terms of capitulation brought forth by the French are rejected by Mockton. Finally, they agree to allow the Colonial Marines to march out of the fort with full honors and be transported to Louisbourg. They pledge not to bear arms in America for six months. All Cadians in the garrison are pardoned. At 7 p.m. that evening, Scots Provincials enter Fort Beausajour and raise the British flag, ending the siege. The Battle of Fort Beausajour, sometimes known as the Battle of Chignecto, had been relatively bloodless, earning it the nickname the Velvet Siege. With the British victory at the Battle of Fort Beausajour, most of Acadia is now effectively under their control. British senior commanders, however, wish to prevent further insurrection and resistance from the local Acadian population, and so from August 10, 1755 to July 11, 1764, they will undertake a series of mass deportations of the Acadian populace in what will become known to history as the expulsion of the Acadians. In an act that is now considered by many historians to be a form of genocide, British troops will oversee the forceful removal of Acadians from their homes and lands before deporting them back to France, clearing Acadia for Anglization. Many of the dislocated Acadians will return to America to the French colony of Louisiana, where they will integrate as Acadians. The victory at Fort Beausajour is some of the only good news to reach Parliament that summer as bad news soon reaches them of a great disaster in the Ohio Valley, where Major General Edward Braddock had been undertaking an offensive expedition to seize Fort Duquesne.